according to our uh, pattern, I would like now to uh, invite uh, two uh, persons who present their communications. That's uh, Daniele Amoroso from the University of Naples and Alexander Moskalenko uh, from Ukraine. Just for two short uh, uh, presentations. If you just take a floor, yeah, and then we'll pass to the discussion. Oh, Thank you. You, you the first. Good morning to everyone. These are not my slides, so there, <laughs> there is no echo. Okay. Um, well. Um, as it is uh, well known to, to this audience, um, since the outbreak of the, the Crimean crisis, Western scholars have um, consistently uh, refused to give particular weight to the self-determination claim coming from pro-Russian uh, separatists and um, the, um, the, the panelists uh, this morning just confirmed this, uh, uh, this approach. Um, I can say that beyond unavoidable and obvious um, uh, nuances, the differences of opinion, uh, the dominating arguments against self-determination of um, Crimea uh, are, are, are two, are basically uh, two. On the one hand, it is uh, contended that uh, regardless of whether the claim was well-founded or not, the fact that um, Russia militarily intervened uh, in, uh, in Crimea, uh, irremediably uh, prejudged the, uh, the legality of the self-determination claim under uh, international law. And on the other hand, uh, it has been uh, argued also uh, here that the Crimean case uh, did not fit with any of the hypotheses where uh, external self-determination is upheld by uh, international law namely uh, colonial or alien domination, or at least this uh, hypothesis is uh, less straightforward, uh, remedial uh, secession. Well, the first argument, so the, the one who um, affirms that uh, Crimea self-determination uh, has been made illegal by uh, Russian intervention uh, can hardly be uh, contested, although I feel sincere sympathy for uh, some of the theses uh, advanced by uh, Professor uh, Tulsik. Um, it is difficult to deny, uh, both in fact uh, and, uh, and the law, that Russian intervention uh, in Crimea was uh, ultimately contrary to uh, the use cogent's prohibition on the use of force, and that fact, uh, according to the doctrine, um, Propounded by uh, Krista Gis, now uh, is part of, uh, of, the, of the case law of the, of the International Court of Justice. This um, made the, the, the declaration of independence of, of Crimea uh, unlawful under international law. Um, my opinion, however, the same conclusion cannot be reached with regard to the second limb, the second argument uh, we, um, I've mentioned, uh, whereby um, the principle of self determination would have nothing to say about the Crimean claim, despite the fact that uh, uh, the majority of the concerned population arguably uh, sustained this claim, as also uh, Christakis um, confirmed. He's not uh, a supporter of, of the Crimean claim, but this is a, a matter of fact, something that one has to take into account. Well, so um, such as a sweeping statement, in, a, uh, in my uh, opinion, seem to be uh, facially at odds, um, facially uh, inconsistent uh, with the core of the principle of self-determination, namely that uh, all people enjoy the right to freely determine um, their political uh, status. On this uh, assumption, I, will, um, um, I think that uh, the question concerning uh, the legal basis of uh, a Crimean claim for self-determination under international law um, should have been uh, um, uh, deserved the further investigation. However, um, since, as I've said, a Russian intervention ended up with uh, rendering the, the, the Crimean Declaration of Independence uh, illegal, under international law, I need to analyze this, uh, this issue by resorting to a sort of uh, fixture, of so um, a fixture juris, namely to consider that such an intervention uh, never, uh, never took place. Um, 
uh, at your set of uh, my analysis, I think that it is appropriate to, uh, to, make the, to draw a distinction um, which uh, should uh, uh, shed some light about um, some of the issues which have been uh, talking about uh, this morning. So a distinction between the principle of self-determination on the one hand and rules originating uh, therefrom, such as the obligation of colonial power to, uh, to grant uh, independence uh, to colonize the territory, or the uh, prohibition of, of, the political, of the political aspect of, of, uh, of apartheid. While, uh, in fact, the, the latter deal with the specific aspect connected to self-determination, uh, the former constitutes, constitutes, constitutes sorry, uh, indeed a structural principle principle of the international legal order, um, which uh, should orientate the, the world community in uh, handling self-determination processes in cases where uh, customary norms have not yet been um, uh, crystallized. Um, as mentioned above, at the core of the principle of self-determination lies the idea that the will of the people should be a decisive factor in uh, shaping the forms and the boundaries of the political uh, authority. Admittedly, however, this is, uh, this is anything but a self-explanatory uh, or self-applying uh, principle. Uh, it's, it's suffice to consider, as uh, uh, Professor Chris Borgen um, recalled, that the very same notion of people lacks uh, an authoritative uh, definition in uh, international law. Moreover, and this was also um, treated, this aspect was also treated uh, today, this principle uh, travels in complementary opposites with other fundamental, other fundamental principles of international law, such as the principle of inter territorial integrity and that of non-interference uh, in internal affairs. So, in order to put this principle into practice in, uh, um, in cases different from those uh, where uh, a specific rule uh, have been formed, is it necessary um, a policy-oriented decision uh, by uh, the international uh, community, a decision which uh, um, has that been uh, evocatively uh, said by one over, result in a clash uh, between the political will of the group uh, uh, which exercised the pouvoir uh, constituant on the one end, and on the other end, the response by various actors of the international community in terms of recognition or non-recognition. This, uh, um, if we accept this, uh, at this point, uh, this uh, inevitably raises uh, the question as to what substantive principles would direct the choices of the relevant uh, decision makers in this, uh, in this subject matter. I think that uh, um, an answer to this, uh, um, to this question may be, uh, hardly be found uh, on the basis of traditional uh, positivist uh, approach, whereby the principle of uh, self-determination uh, represent, is represented, is looked at um, as a rule whose content uh, has to be determined on the basis of the analysis of, of uh, past accumulated uh, decisions, as Rosalind uh, Higgins and uh, the, the, the scholars of the New England School uh, said, because outside colonial uh, context, indeed, uh, state practice is largely uh, contradictory, so uh, does not help in, uh, in, the, in uh, resolving issues of self-determination. It, uh, 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 <laughs> it is indeed needed to, uh, to look at the, the international regime uh, of self-determination in its uh, dynamic um, aspect, namely as a process managed by the international community through um, international regional organization or through less formal channels with a view of ensuring the core of the principle, namely that the freely expressed will of the people is given due consideration when the fundamental decisions regarding statehood are at the stake. To this end, and um, this is my, um, the, the core of my, uh, my opinion, is that a, valu a valuable contribution may be offered by the policy-oriented jurisprudence by the New Haven uh, School, whose focus, as it is uh, widely known, is precisely on the dynamics of the decision-making uh, process. 
of course, there is no need, and in any case, there is not enough time to uh, provide uh, 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 this, this audience with a detailed account of the complex uh, analytical grid through which uh, New Haven scholars examine and assess international uh, decision-making processes. I will limit myself to uh, recalling that, uh, according to this uh, uh, jurisprudence, such processes um, should foster the basic goals of the world community, namely should tend to enhance uh, the overall enjoyment of human values, which are analytically de described by, by New Haven scholars, but I, I, will, I won't do, um, on the part of the affected communities, and this is called the optimum uh, public order, by avoiding, at the same time, violence and instability to the extent uh, possible, well, uh, whereas the, um, the minimum public uh, order. In this perspective, a claim for Please external... Keep time. Of course. Well, I, I just to, 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 to get the... the, the, the Very to, okay. Well, um, the point is uh, that in, in, in assessing and in taking in a, the, the political decision, the international community about uh, um, issues of self-determination should, uh, some policy factors should be taken um, into, uh, into account, which uh, includes the um, among others, the, the effects of the, uh, the self-determination claim on the outside um, uh, environment, including uh, the, the remaining people and uh, the, the, the world uh, order at large, but also the uh, intensity of the demand of the concerned uh, people. So, um, I think that um, if we pass, I conclude here, if we have to consider whether uh, the, the, uh, um, whether the self-determination claim by uh, the Crimean people uh, would have been legitimate under this, uh, under this test, I think that, uh, um, of course, I cannot uh, um, develop uh, further argument on, on this point, but I think, I think that at least uh, it would be arguable that some elements uh, were uh, um, in support of, of, this, uh, uh, of this claim, and uh, uh, probably the most important are those, uh, um, those recalled by uh, Batozic, in, in the sense that, uh, um, and, uh, thank you, that uh, the, um, the Crimean people claim for self-determination uh, arises after a coup who uh, overthrew a, a political leader who, for better or for worse, acted as a guarantor of the peoples living uh, in the Russian ethnic uh, regions. So, uh, please while respect it is, is, uh, the rules. Please respect the rules. Of course. Well, I uh, just concluded by saying... <laughs> I just conclude, please. Huh? Okay. Hello. So, I, I conclude. Thank you. Sorry for, for the time I've taken. Thank you very much for limiting, uh, I'm sorry for uh, limiting your freedom of speech, uh, but the rules were established, so, uh, Mr. Moskalenko. Yes, uh, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, thank you very much for inviting me for the conference. Um, well, the topic of my presentation is uh, more about the procedure. We, I was really lucky to uh, fit in uh, with the topic which uh, was not really covered uh, by uh, other uh, presenters. So my presentation consists of three parts. Uh, first part gives a general um, context. Uh, the second uh, concentrates upon specific uh, Crimean issues. And third one uh, offers a little bit wider context. Uh, I'll try to be very uh, scientific in the first two parts. And I'll put some uh, of my attitude in the third part. So, um, well, international standards of um, uh, fulfillment of secession and uh, self-determination right are very well developed. So everybody uh, knows the issue. It's a dichotomy of two major principles uh, uh, with a focus on mostly uh, procedure. As uh, the um, issue of uh, secession and self-determination right were often used uh, to uh, mask uh, some uh, aggression of different countries. So, what about the cases? Well, some of the cases were really mentioned. Some of them come from the uh, period of decolonization. Uh, others are kind of contemporary, uh, meaning that uh, these uh, cases had also 
uh, been uh, in the practice of uh, international community. And, uh, okay, now comes uh, the issue of procedure. I think the procedure is really important because uh, uh, devil is usually in details. Uh, and the proper procedure is the major tool to ensure that uh, any right, it, and uh, especially the right uh, with such a sensitive political uh, color as the self-determination right, uh, really is important. So decades of uh, practice of international law developed um, the procedure which actually includes uh, the formation of uh, existence of some political movement or political party and uh, this party usually declares a goal, then uh, confirms legitimacy by some kind of election or referendum, and then uh, it tries to fulfill the goal that it declared before. In conflict -like cases, uh, international organizations were involved in the process, and uh, well, mostly, most often the United Nations, to confirm the decision and uh, uh, the outcome of the referendum. Well, uh, Important notes. Usually this process involves uh, appearance uh, of uh, high-profile national leaders, uh, involves uh, the development of a political process, raising all national debates uh, and uh, the debates of the territory which is in question. Uh, usually the issue of uh, secession and self-determination right is in the, uh, in the constitutional law context and uh, involves uh, um, international organization for supervision and uh, recognition of the outcome of the uh, referendum results. So I decided to compare what actually took place in uh, uh, Crimea with the uh, latest uh, referendum before the Crimea. Uh, Scottish National Party declared the issue of uh, Scottish independence uh, uh, for its election manifesto. In, uh, well, in this way, they confirmed uh, the idea that uh, Scotland will actually need some kind of referendum because uh, in Scotland, uh, this national party got uh, two thirds of the all its seats. Thus, they just uh, uh, announced the referendum in 2012. And uh, they had 16 weeks of debates about the issue of independence. And uh, actually, a referendum took place in 2014, like seven years after it was initially announced. And now comes the Crimean referendum. So, uh, who are the people? Yeah, yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you everything. Don't worry about that. Okay, so who are actually the people who were speaking on, the, on behalf of uh, uh, Crimea? So, was there any constitutional context? Uh, you see all the questions that uh, arise uh, uh, with regards to this referendum. Uh, many of these questions were already dealt with um, by uh, our speakers, and uh, well, we certainly had a discussion uh, of the constitutional context. Uh, the, international involvement of, uh, uh, and uh, this is the first question I would like to concentrate. Uh, who are actually the people who signed the uh, uh, agreement with Russia about uh, uh, Crimea becoming part of Russia? Like three people, a mayor of Sevastopol, prime minister, uh, a mayor of uh, Sevastopol, Mr. Charlie, prime minister of Crimea, Mr. Aksyonov, and chairman of the Council of uh, State Council of Crimea, Mr. Konstantinov. So the first one, he's a Russian citizen who was actually uh, elected as a mayor of uh, Sebastopol in street, and there was no there was no actual position of the mayor of Sebastopol in Ukrainian constitution. So they just took a Russian guy with Russian passport and said, you're going to be a mayor of Sevastopol to write the agreement. Okay, this is the first one. The second one is uh, criminal nickname Goblin. So with uh, his own criminal uh, record history. And this guy uh, organized the old Ukrainian party called uh, Ukraine, uh, Russian Unity. So uh, he was stupid enough to call his 
all Ukrainian party Russian unity. There is no surprise that he got only 4% of votes in the Crimea and never got any seat in the Ukrainian parliament. The third guy, uh, nobody knows what is State Council of Crimea because there was no such an uh, institution actually in Ukraine or in Crimea before Russian troops came. So this is the first question. The second question comes about the referendum. Well, there is, I don't think there is any uh, question about uh, Russian military intervention left, especially after the film, uh, Russian film where Putin uh, himself accepts these facts. So this is an uh, absolutely clear case. There was an intervention and the referendum was organized already after the intervention took place. It's certainly against the constitution, it was um, underlined uh, several times, but nobody really cared uh, during the organization of the referendum. Certainly there was no debate, no voter list because they were uh, in Ukrainian possession. Somebody printed, well, two, maybe two in the 2.2 million uh, bailout papers, maybe more, maybe less. Nobody actually knows. Uh, with the population of, uh, Ukra of Crimea uh, being like 600,000 people less than the bailouts were pr printed. And uh, no observers were uh, at the, this referendum to see actually how it was going on. So the time schedule, that's really something interesting. If you compare it to seven years uh, of uh, preparation of Scottish uh, referendum, you can see what actually happened in the, in the Crimea. So Russian gunmen who actually uh, captured the building of the uh, Crimean Soviet, uh, Crimean parliament, uh, just said, well, there should be a referendum. And there was announced at this Actually, nobody knows how many people were there because there is no official record of this uh, session. And uh, the idea was to have a referendum in May, like in three months. Like in two days, they decided to change the date of referendum. Said, no way. It should be like in the end of March now. On the, third, on the 6th of March, uh, they said, no way. We should make it like in two weeks, maybe. So. Well, and actually it took, took place on the 16th of March, like seven day, 17 days after it was announced. Ah. And on the next day, Putin was already giving his Crimean speech, signing the membership treaty, and uh, well, in one day more, they made a ratification of, the, uh, of this treaty. Well, perhaps here I should have made a stop and say like, well, um, it's a clear-cut case of uh, annexation and uh, uh, military aggression uh, having nothing to do with uh, anything like of self-determination right or secession right. But then uh, I thought to myself something. And uh, I thought I should have some kind of uh, little bit more uh, personal expression. Um, well, you also had the, your own chance to see, actually, to hear what language was used here. So all our uh, speakers, except maybe for Professor Tolstich, were using very exact language. So clear-cut case, no discussion, absolutely clear, clear crystal clear. So, uh, and I felt actually the same way. When I was preparing my presentation, I felt the same way. It's just an absolutely clear case, having nothing to do with secession or uh, self-determination right. It's pure aggression. And then I thought to myself, it's a joke. Guys, it's just a joke. I mean, because you cannot treat it seriously. Nobody having uh, any kind of uh, imp impartial uh, political uh, background and uh, uh, at least basic legal degree would ever ask, say that it's serious. It's just a joke. Yeah. So, and then comes maybe. Uh, just could the, you please come to your conclusions? Oh, yeah, yeah, my conclusions. I'm yes. afraid yeah, yeah. we are very uh, maybe, short of time. Maybe I just want one, one minute to, to make it a little bit uh, bigger. So the actual story goes like uh, Russian-led uh, gunmen captured uh, the building of the Soviet and they 
took out three goblins out of nowhere and uh, made them write the agreement. It's, uh, it's not uh, serious. It's like more for to another token novel than for political debate. Uh, my conclusions, uh, besides, besides what I have already mentioned, that it is clear case of, sorry? Yeah. Um, my conclusions are these. Uh, please beware about president, Russian leader, who is joking and having his nuclear button in, the, in, the, in his pocket. So please beware about, about uh, the partner who doesn't care about any law, any treaties, and any uh, basic order of the international law. And maybe one more last uh, uh, conclusion. Please beware of the war coming back to the uh, Europe as an instrument of politics. Uh, may, uh, just to, to finish the story, uh, in, in May I was in the conference in Brussels and uh, after the conference I was sitting uh, uh, next to a lady and she was from from European Defense uh, uh, Agency. And when I learned that I said, wow, it's really nice to meet you. You are just the right person to come to Ukraine. She said, no, no, no. Uh, we are in Europe are not really very much con uh, concerned about the crisis. It's something like far away, something not too much uh, interesting for us. Uh, she's Dutch. I sincerely hope that neither uh, she nor any of her relatives actually um, had any problems with this uh, tragedy that took place uh, in the sky over Donetsk. But this actually shows that the war, uh, which uh, was started by the uh, Russian state, is not far away. It's not even next door. It's right in your beautiful European house. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentations. Uh, and now I would like to invite uh, questions. We'll start with Matthias here. Question and remarks. Um, I come from Heidelberg, from Germany. And in the 20s, there was a famous Nobel Prize winner, Mr. Leonard, a physicist. And he wrote a book about German physics. I think, against, by the way, against the general theory of relativity. I think science is something we have in common. I'm not here as a German. I'm not here defending the position of the European uh, Union. I'm here as an uh, international lawyer. And when I'm talking about, and I take position to one or the other uh, 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 contributions, I'm doing it as an international lawyer, not defending any position, official position of any government. This is very important. Therefore, I'm not very happy if you said, I have as a Russian citizen to defend the position of Russia, or if you said, you and me, you and me, it's nothing. You know, if you think there's another side who will attack you. We are, have to discuss, to discuss your, your arguments, but not because you are Russian and I'm not attacking you or criticizing you because I'm German. I think this is very important from the very beginning. So, having said that, I would say the case is not that difficult under international law. Uh, and here I fully share and sign up to what uh, Theodore uh, told us. It's, it's a very clear-cut case. And I think it's not that helpful to quote Agamben and even the Pope. If we want to, 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 to settle the question, we have to look into international law. And we have to quote basic principles as the territorial integrity, and we have to look into the treaties. The treaties have to be mentioned, they have to be analyzed. And without the treaties, uh, circumventing the treaties, bypassing the treaties, we will not reach a solution. This must be very clear. And I do not want to say there is one solution or the other, but we have to use the treaties. This is very important. And then the next thing is, of course, we have to look what was a practice. And here it is, of course, interesting also to have a look into the Russian practice. And I already quoted once the fantastic decision of the Russian Constitutional Court of 1992 concerning Tatarstan. It was repeated in 1994 with respect to Chechnya. And now the question is, if you want to have an answer to the question, what is the relationship between international uh, territorial integrity and self-determination, just have a look at this decision. 
And if you have another position, it's up to you. But then you have to go to Mr. Zorkin and tell him it was rubbish what you said. It is completely the other way around. And then I come to the next point. I hope, I really hope, for the sake of the Russian Federation, that the principle you mentioned will never apply to your country. Because you will lose big parts of your, your country in the, in the near future. I hope it will never apply. The Western states were very firm in the position that Chechia has no right to secede. The Tatarstan has no right to secede. If you apply the, the principles you use now, you will lose part of your, your, of your territory. This was completely clear. And in the end, again, I would like to underline, we have a common science and we have not to defend specific positions because they are our countries. And here I'm not fully, I do not fully agree with your position when you mentioned the case of Kosovo. I'm very critical with Kosovo. And we should not quote uh, cases where other violations of international law, uh, law had happened. And here with respect to the American position, I share the position and perhaps everybody shares the position. And pure declaration of independence is innocent. It's not a violation of international law. But another thing is the, the, the recognition of such a state. This is an intervention in internal affairs, and this was a violation undertaken by the United States and also by Germany. He has no, no, uh, no, no doubt about it. And we should be able to criticize also the position of our country. Thank you very much. Next questions, please. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful uh, debate and discussion. After these uh, lectures, I now I'm, um, I can say I got expertise in international law, which is, besides other, other my, 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 my skills. Yes, I'm, 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 very, I'm very glad. And what I have some now some conclusion from this le lecture, I know that the law is dictated by winners. And uh, from the point of view of Russia, you are right, you have everything uh, did correct, even you accuse a uh, cop in Ukraine, which as a, as a word they didn't recognize. I also thank my Russian colleagues here, you, uh, I, I completely share your point of view, the self-determination is very important things. Yes, so I'm waiting when you give freedom for Chechnya and other people who are looking for it. Thank you very much. Anatoly, Anatoly, you are the next. Well, first, just Mr. Mershko, and uh, then Anatoly. Yeah. Uh, to Professor Kapustin and shortly. Uh, Kaliningrad State University, Manehu Kant University, Kaliningrad, Alexander Salenko. First of all, thank you for wonderful presentations. And I have a, one question to our Professor uh, Christakis and one question to our US professor. Uh, first question is, uh, you said that uh, please don't apply this historical background. Please comment the self-determination of Baltic republics. In my position, this was really uh, under pretext of historical issues and Soviet occupation. The second question to our colleague from US. You said uh, the most uh, important problem in Crimea, I'm not talking about eastern part of Ukraine, uh, but it was use of force by Russian forces. Don't you think that in the Kosovo independence case, it was also the same problem or defect that there was so-called uh, um, elaboration army of Kosovo? And the question was who financed the weapons, who gave money, and uh, was it without any introduction or uh, without any force from outside? And that's why how you commend the independence of Kosovo in this context. Thank you. Once again. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to make uh, only some comments, no, no questions, because I understand that all are <laughs> tired. Uh, first of all, uh, I, um, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, I don't remember uh, in the history, in new history, in the old history of the humanity, only one case of self-determination, which was uh, recognized by all or by applauses uh, by both parts state, uh, the part uh, which disintegrated and so on. 
except maybe uh, Czechoslovakia in new history, it was very civilized uh, uh, way, and I applaud uh, both parts because they uh, were very proud, and so it's, it's maybe a unique case. The second one, when we discussing the problem of Kosovo or comparing it with uh, Crimea, etc., I was in, uh, I, I, I was, the, I have my personal opinion, because I was in uh, 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 Serbia before bom uh, bombing, uh, Serbia after bombing, uh, two months uh, after, I, I saw the results of peaceful uh, uh, self-determination of Kosovo. It's not necessary to convict me that it was so civilized and so on. I saw personally. Then I was in Kosovo after that bombing, after the pro proclamation of uh, uh, self-determination. And I uh, can saw there uh, the real uh, situation between uh, different uh, parts of this country or, or, or state, if you want. There, are, there, are, there is a very big tension there. So it's not example for good result uh, such kind of question. But I'm not uh, against Kosovo, against Kosovo or people of Kosovo. It's people of Kosovo, it's also it's very, uh, very complicated uh, definition or a very complicated uh, community. And then, when we say about the position of Russian Federation, of the Russian Federation, official position and not official, uh, and, uh, uh, of course uh, we discussed this problem not only in official uh, uh, level, but in our session of international law. And uh, yes, of course, it's, 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 uh, it's true. We uh, uh, thought that uh, uh, the situation of uh, recognition, the act of uh, um, independence, it will be the clear, the clear, not not any uh, 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 conjecture, the, the, the clear uh, violation of uh, the principle of territorial integrity of Serbia. It's, it's no problem. But uh, after. This, all these uh, um, events in, in Kosovo and, and, and so on, uh, we understand that uh, it's, it's uh, to, possible to, uh, to proclaim that it's a legal situation, so, but it's real situation. Maybe legal, illegal, unlawful, but real. It's example, it's not maybe precedent, precedent but it's example for others. I think it's uh, worth uh, the principal idea of the Russian uh, officials when uh, in UN and other uh, places they uh, uh, try to convict that it's not necessary to do this very, very dangerous step to, to recognize uh, Kosovo. But it's real now. Not all Europeans recognize, uh, we know that uh, Kosovo, but many uh, recognize and so on. Then uh, about the Chechnya. Uh, unfortunately, my friend uh, uh, come, come out, uh, but uh, I want to, uh, to remember that except Chechnya, there are a lot of national republic, uh, republics in, in the Russian Federation. During this very, very difficult uh, period of, of our history, from 1991, to uh, 2000, uh, maybe two, three, some republics, not only Chechnya, but Tatar Republic, Bashkir Republic, and uh, some others proclaimed independence from Russia. And they wrote on their constitutions, uh, local constitutions, that they are subject of international law, that they ha have right to, to secede from Russia, and so on. We lived this uh, period, we could uh, survive, uh, and we resolve, except Chechnya, uh, with all these regions, uh, from, uh, for uh, legal ways, uh, for uh, constitutional court of the Russian Federation, who uh, uh, considers these cases uh, against these republics, and uh, considered uh, and uh, held that uh, this uh, positions of the, this uh, provisions of the constitution are illegal, and so on. Then. Uh, Chechnya. 
Chechnya is also, it's, uh, we can uh, say a lot of things about Chechnya, but uh, for me it's clear that uh, the war in Chechnya, it was not only uh, some, uh, uh, <laughs> I know personally one of my students, unfortunately, was one of the leader, uh, leaders of separatists. And I, I speak uh, with him, uh, uh, as like you, I speak with you now. And he said, we never want to, uh, to secede from Russia. We want to, uh, to, to receive more, uh, more independence, more autonomy, and so on. But why uh, you say so? We want to receive finance. We want to receive uh, money. I don't uh, say from what countries, he said me. So it's a different case, I think, and, 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 at last. Uh, by conclusion, we have two Vladislav here, one Vladislav from Poland and other Vladislav from Russia. I see uh, on this uh, name one from W and, uh, that, uh, and other uh, use uh, the V uh, letters, different letters, but the same, uh, uh, the same name. I think uh, this uh, discussing this not uh, I, I understand that's very 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 difficult situation so on but discussing this problem we have different uh, looks different uh, um, um, definitions different uh, approaches to the same situation it's it's normally it's normally I think I I, I like uh, the Theodore presentation and the Christopher I, I say why. Uh, they, uh, I, I don't agree with all this, uh, 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 the, uh, the, all these provisions, which all the studies which uh, they um, said. But uh, the, 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 I, I support the main idea that it's not uh, questions in international in international law, not international politics. In politics, it's other thing. Not all questions are clear. Uh, when we're talking about uh, self-determination or remedial secession or all, or only secession and so on. But there is some way to resolve them. So I, uh, uh, I ask you uh, to find re results, to find a way. We, we Russians uh, want uh, that Ukraine will be a good state, good neighbor, uh, and I, I, I hope it will be. Uh, we hope to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Maybe for for uh, for for one time we forget. Then we uh, we are neighbors. We, it's it's impossible to go, go separately. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, just to. Two last questions from the audience, and then I would like to give floor to the panelists for short. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, please. Uh, my name is Patricia Grzebek, I'm from the University of Warsaw, and I have the question concerning the right to the self-determination. Um, I agree with um, um, Professor Christiakis on the right to external self-determination, but I think that we uh, forget about this, that in case of Crimea, we are not talking about this traditional self-determination to create your own state, but we are talking about determination which would consist on accession to another state. And you, you have emphasized uh, the issue that uh, uh, this uh, prohibition to, self, to external self-determination uh, has a universal meaning. But I think that in case of Europe, especially of Eastern Europe, it has another dimension because uh, we decided that because we have so many minorities on different countries in Eastern Europe that for us it's better to uh, preserve peace by protect, uh, protection of uh, the borders which we have. And now I think that uh, the problem is not that the people wanted to self-determine themselves and to create their state, but what we can observe is the alteration of borders, which we treated as something, something saint in, uh, in Europe. And the problem is, of course, that uh, certainly um, w uh, it was also underlined in other, uh, present, uh, in other presentations that, uh, um, okay, um, we should not uh, call another violations of law to uh, justify what uh, happened in case of Crimea. But also we must have in mind that international law sometimes is changing and maybe this is the attempt to create a new customer law, I don't know, new uh, uh, 
new, new law based on the Kosovo precedent, based, based on the fact that uh, we are creating new states like South Sudan and that we now we have this uh, Crimean case. That this which, what we talk about, this instant customs. Maybe this is the attempt to create another instant custom in international law. Thank you. Uh, Jankovic Sava, University of Warsaw. I have two questions. One is directed to the first speaker. And is it possibly possible at all to talk about the legal aspects of state's creation in international law? If you follow the reasoning of Lotus case where everything is, uh, is possible uh, when it's not prohibited, then we don't know when, where we are. You said that the uh, declaration of independence are not regulated by international law. And consequently, the uh, recognition of states is also a mere political act. So we can imagine the creation of new states uh, that not necessarily violate peremptory norms of international law. And um, yeah, and the second question to the second speaker: um, What's the difference between the ethnic community in Crimea and in Kosovo? What's the difference between? Uh, Russian minority in Crimea and or majority or Albanian minority or majority in Kosovo. Is it not that uh, the national minorities are not entitled to the right of self-determination in view of the Badminton uh, Commission opinion about the Yugoslavia where Serbs were not entitled to self-determination in Croatia and in Bosnia? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I would, uh, I'd like now to invite the speakers, uh, or the panelists of this morning, and I would like to ask you to be very brief. We start with Maria. Yeah. Well, I have one remark to make and two questions to the panelists of today. Um, Question yeah, but we can continue in writing and uh, later. I just want to, to mark them. Uh, the remark, um, as regards the pictures that were shown, if I were not uh, of the Member of Parliament in Kiev uh, beatings during the Maidan, if I were not a lawyer, um, I would also present a picture of a dead body of a leader of the opposition in Russia lying on the bridge in front of the Kremlin. And I would ask you, what relevance does it have on the issue of secession and self-determination of various Russian regions? I'm not making that. I am raising it now because I think that accurately reflects a mess of the arguments in this regard. Um, those are not connected at all. My uh, learned Russian opponents would probably respond that it's totally different because that was just a guy not really even having political influence and not in the government, he was a former government, a governor, he was a former uh, member of the government of Russia, and he was functioning in a situation where our, our official government uh, denotes us as national betrayers and fifth column. That uh, brings me to a question uh, to Professor Kapustin and other colleagues from Russia, do you understand in which situation um, we are now putting with this rhetoric our personal individual positions when you disagree with something? And I, I want to tell this. I kindly and firmly ask the Russian, uh, Russian Association of International Law to refrain from remarks which offend my legal ethics. Please do not approach me in coffee breaks to say that I was, p that I was paid for presenting my opinion. Well, technically, my expenses were covered by the organizers, but I think that's a general principle of conferences. Um, my views are independent. I make this disclaimer. If you want to question them, please go ahead, but please do, them, do this publicly. Thank you. Uh, my two questions would be to Professor Tolstig. Um, how do you reconcile? Uh, your, as I read your articles in uh, the Chinese Journal of International and uh, the same article in Russian, how do you reconcile the positions of Rousseau, uh, Hobbes, Locke, 
uh, with your claim that the well, you have an extensive argument on the consequence, the, the Ukrainian crisis mm -hmm. uh, stemming from the attack of liberal values. So you basically, you have a lot to say against the liberal, liberal values, which violate uh, which violate the essence of the state. Uh, how do you reconcile this? Uh, arguments against liberalism uh, with the fact that Rousseau, Locke, and Hobbes are actually the founders of liberalism in, in philosophy. And my last question would be well, I'm afraid about the failed the state. Okay, is thank you. Over. Sorry. Okay, my last question will be published. At some okay, uh, Alexandre. Yeah, thank you very much for the, uh, and it was very, really, really interesting not to talk but to hear. And it's very interesting to hear my colleagues, and I thank you very much. My only, my just only one remark. It's absolutely clear, it's absolutely clear to everybody, Gen ladies and gentlemen, there is a breach of law. There is a violation of law. If we will allow such arguments, let's a factual situation. Well, it was a breach of law, but it's a factual situation. Well. That's a right of might. Of course, Ukraine is seven times smaller than Russia. Of course, we didn't have our own, let's say, big leaders which led our country to the European Union. Of course, we don't have the perspective, and we have said several times, to, uh, to NATO, to align to NATO. But this is not the case to leave Ukraine alone against the aggression, against the brutal violation of law, and to say that maybe in the future, if you will conduct your, uh, maybe we will help you. I think that the only, just only one principle which was declared in Helsinki in 1975, there is no chance to reconsider all the borders in Europe, because that will lead to tremendous disaster to everybody. And I think that notwithstanding the factual situation that this principle, I think it's not a universal, it's a European principle, and we know this, I think that's, that will be a real disaster. And we know that Russia is violating this principle, and every time he's saying that it's a factual situation. In Transnistria, once. In Georgia, twice. In, Ab in Abkhazia, thrice. Ukraine, and after that, who will be the next? I think we just think like international lawyers, notwithstanding any emotions, and we'll have to protect the international law, nothing more. That's it, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I have plenty of questions. I will be as brief as possible. First, Alexander made a parallel between use of force in Crimea by Russia and use of force by NATO in Kosovo in 1999. I entirely agree with you. And I can even tell you that uh, 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 I was very critical at that moment, uh, saying that this was a clear violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter. And I think that uh, from many points of view, it was worse than Crimea, because in Crimea there was no bloodshed, whatever the outcome, it was no bloodshed, while NATO uh, states were bombing Serbia, everything in Serbia for six months. Let's not forget it. Now, what is the legal value of this for our discussion about Crimea? First, let's say that these events happened in 1999. Kosovo declared its independence in 2008. I was very surprised to see that my colleagues who pleaded for Serbia in the ICJ never used the argument. I went there and I saw them and said, why you didn't use the argument? You were trying to say that the declaration of independence of Kosovo was illegal, and you never mentioned that Serbia was bombed uh, uh, for six months in 1999. And I think that if they didn't use the argument, it is because they were thinking that the causality link was broken. It was too remote. Uh, the declaration of independence of Kosovo took place in 2008. There were no bombings, no use of force in 2008. But of course, this logic, we have to apply it also for remedial secession, it's completely absurd to talk about violation of human rights in Kosovo in 2008. Uh, there were no violations. There were violations in 1998, not in 2008, which means that the uh, 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 violation of human rights plus 
illegal use of force by NATO, where events of 1999, which are not relevant anymore in order to assess the legal situation of Kosovo in 2008. Now, the th last part, even if, the, if it was possible to use this argument, what difference does it make for Crimea? If we say that uh, what happened in Kosovo was illegal, Okay, but two wrongs do not make a right, once again. Uh, and uh, uh, precisely, we're going to all conference, I'm going to all conference, try to defend, not Russia, not Ukraine, uh, not Kosovo, not Serbia, but international law. And it would be great if finally, one day uh, we uh, abandon these scenic violations of international law, and we try to, because we have a very good international law system, it was a big conquest of humanity, and we need to defend it. What is the result? We see here former neighbors and friends, and I come to your uh, remark, uh, that uh, uh, as a matter of fact are waging wars, uh, that that are speaking about jokes, about schizophrenia of one leader or about violation of human rights by the other. And as a matter of fact, this is a terrible situation if only, if only we could apply international law, we could go back uh, to the kingdom of international law. Things could be much, much better. And I think that this is extremely important. So to come to your point, you talked about de facto situations, of course, but let's make no mistake. Uh, these are de facto illegal situations, okay? What is going on in uh, Crimea or in the Turkish Republic of North Cyprus are the results of uh, violations of fundamental rules of international law. You know that they have Greek origins, uh, and uh, of course I would love to say that according to international law, Turkey must give back uh, the Turkish Republic, the, well, the north part of Cyprus to Cyprus. This is what international law says. But we have a de facto situation and we know that this will never happen. So, the only solution to this will be to try to find a negotiated solution, but negotiated solution does not mean to accept illegal effectivity. Ne a negotiated solution means to try to uh, uh, put back, to find a negotiated solution which will uh, f find a compromise between what the law says and, about, with, uh, uh, and reality. The third question was about, uh, uh, you said that this is not a case of creation of a new state, it's a question of annexation. Uh, it's different, alteration of borders. Well, as a matter of fact, we could discuss endlessly about that. Don't forget that Kos the Kosovars didn't want to create an independent state. They wanted to join in Albania, but the West, who's, who backed them always since the Rambouille agreement is from the beginning, told them that uh, attention, because if you try to join Albania, then we'll talk about greater Albania and alteration of borders, and uh, this will remind us of greater Serbia that we tried to combat. So this is a kind of politics, but if uh, in uh, 20 years from now, for example, there is an, uh, a referendum in Kosovo in order to join Albania, I can hardly see in what legal basis we could say that this is not possible. So the second of the events in Crimea was the same, although this happened, as you, you said before, in, in a few days, not in years or decades, uh, uh, which is that first they uh, organized a referendum, create, uh, um, declared independence, and then they asked to join, which means that the real problem is not there, unfortunately. The real problem is military intervention from the outside. And uh, you spoke about possibility of instant custom. Well, uh, uh, I can give you the response that Sir Robert Jennings uh, uh, gave when uh, uh, Chen wrote this. He said it is probably instant because it was not a custom, and of course, uh, 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 w the law can change, not instantly, the law can change, but in order to change, we have to follow the path. We need practice, opinion, juris. And I can find absolutely no precedent going towards uh, the idea of a recognition of a right to secession. South Sudan goes consensual. Every time that's consensual, we don't even ask the question because the real problem is, is there a right to unilateral secession when the uh, central government opposes? So Scotland or South Sudan uh, or the last phase, uh, f phase of Eritrea, for example, this is absolutely no relevant for a custom uh, creating uh, a right to unilateral session outside the colonial context. And we, uh, we have a complete absence of opinion juries. I found absolutely no state. Probably Russia now started saying this, but uh, I have studied, for example, Article 1, all the uh, subsequent practice of Article 1. I have never found a single state of the 167 states to the ICPR who said that Article 1 should be interpreted uh, in such uh, a way. And of course, Russia was absolutely against. Which, 
Last question, I didn't see who asked it because uh, uh, you were hidden, but uh, uh, it's obvious, my answer. You said, uh, can we really talk about legal aspects in the, uh, in the process of creation of states? The answer is clearly yes, of course, we can. And this is why I t told you that uh, I'm against this old idea of Jelinek, of a state as a primary fact, and uh, comparing with uh, a rape uh, and uh, the uh, child uh, uh, born by a rape, of of course, we have very important legal principles. Secession is not prohibited, but we have very important legal principles uh, here and uh, the uh, prohibition of military intervention by a third state in favor of secession is one of the most fundamental among them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, thank you once again for all the great questions. Just a few quick comments uh, since I think um, uh, some of them have already been answered. Uh, the first is to pick up on one of the final questions, which was, wh what's the difference between the, the rights of uh, Crimeans versus the rights of Kosovars, if any? And based on the analysis that I mentioned on the idea of the consensus analysis, the, the point is that neither one would have a right to remedial secession, that neither Kosovars nor Crimeans would have a right to, uh, as a matter of right, to become a separate country. And that's actually the heart of what I was trying to point out, is the bias against the idea of remedial secession, the lack of state practice in favor of remedial secession. Um, but then, of course, we have you know, what happened in these, two, in these two cases, which picks up on some of the earlier questions on, in, re, in relation to, in part, the issue of recognition. Here, um, looking to the issue of intervention first, um, I would sort of reiterate what's been said before, which is that you can look to both interventions and decide that both NATO's intervention and the intervention of Russia are illegal. Um, in fact, many US international lawyers in 1999 said that the as a matter of law, they think that NATO's intervention goes against the UN Charter. They happen to think that for political reasons, it's something that some of them might be in favor of, but they understand as lawyers that this would go against the UN Charter. The difference, though, um, is when you look at how the facts diverge from the point of there having been an intervention. That is, in, Na in the regards of Kosovo, there's NATO's intervention, but then after that, there's the internationalization with the UN's administration over nine years, the work of the Troika in that time to mediate a solution, and all of the subsequent history over multiple years. In regards to Crimea, what you had was a very fast move from intervention, declaration of independence, annexation, well, reunification, however you want to term it. Really, it doesn't matter at that point. Over the matter of days. And those, and so in my answer to you, I, I think that, and I'm sorry, is it Professor? Professor, sorry. sorry. I, I think that the, the difference is that the, the facts are different. I try to, in looking at this, I think that you can apply the same sort of rubric of law, but the, but the material facts are different, that can lead you to different results. Now, we can disagree over the analysis. I think that there's a certain amount of an agreement over the rules, but there might be a disagreement over the analysis at times, but I think that what's important is that we're going back to some of the same texts and techniques. The same text in terms of treaties, some of the same techniques in terms of looking at what is or is not customary international law. Now, I'd mentioned this, the consensus interpretation of the relationship of self-determination to secession. I mentioned it as a consensus, but not as a singular interpretation, because there is at times some difference within that view. Um, uh, two Russian international lawyers, uh, Chernichenko and Kotliar, had written an interesting article in 2003 looking at a series of conferences over the preceding three years and some of the similarities and differences of views of the various international lawyers involved. And one of the things that they mentioned in regards to the U.S. in, in terms of U.S. views and European views is that they noted that U.S. lawyers were more likely to emphasize the idea of the silence of international law in regards to secession. That is, that secession is neither a right, nor is it illegal. Whereas at times you had some of the European lawyers who would emphasize more, uh, perhaps, an illegality of secession, that is going a little bit beyond. There's a certain amount of agreement, or there's a lot of agreement, I think, in terms of the views of those U.S. lawyers and those European lawyers, not on everything, though. The importance is on having a common process in terms of resolving our disagreements. We may or may not always uh, uh, actually persuade each other, but the techniques are what's important. And this comes back in part to 
uh, the question of, uh, one of the last questions on this, on whether or not Europe had some specific rules in regards to being against annexation that are different. And I think one of the key things here is first realizing that the argument that was made by Russia is that what you had here was first an attempt at independence, so, which is why I think we were focusing on the question of Crimea as becoming an independent state, and then Russia argued that from its point of independence, it then chose to reunify with Russia, which is why you have Russian official statements stating this is a reunification, not an annexation. So in terms of dealing with that question, you have to in part look at this question in terms of whether or not there was sort of a credible claim in terms of, of uh, statehood. The last thing that I'll say in terms of, of Kosovo and Crimea is that to, if you take the view that there's a certain silence in international law in regards to some of these actions, but that what you have ultimately is actions by the international community, you see that in subsequent years we've had recognition of Kosovo by, I, I'm not sure of the exact number at the moment, I think it's about 120 states. Um, in terms of the recognition of South Ossetia, Abkhazia, or even Crimea for that whatever the half an hour or whatever that they were an independent state one, one day, that they claimed it, um, you don't see that. And I think that you get a sense of the views of the international community from those actions as well. So in short, we have to work at finding sort of common techniques and going back to common texts and, te and techniques in terms of resolving these situations. You might not agree on everything, but there are still some things that regardless, I think are clearly illegal. Maria, Maria, thank you very much for your questions. Um, I would like to, to begin by a joke. I like very much a Polish film uh, whose name is Sex Mission. Sex Mission. And there is a sex scene in this film when uh, two men are accused to be men. To be men. And the girls ask them, what could you say in, in defense of men? And one of them uh, said, Einstein was man. And all girls said, no, Einstein was woman. So when you speak that Rousseau was liberalist, he was not liberalism. Direct quotation of Rousseau, a general will is meaningless without general interest. It's a direct quotation of Rousseau. And liberalism is a priority of private interest. So that is very important problem, and I'm very grateful for, you, for your questions because actual discourse is constricted and there are a lot of ideas which are excluded from this discourse. Not only people of Crimea was excluded from political communications. Some part of our colleagues proposed to us to accept very narrow discourse economical discourse, liberal discourse, if you want. And we don't accept it. So we, we have to, to because, because I, I think that we have, we don't accept it because the world is bigger than economical approach. The world is bigger than human rights approach. So it's my opinion. And it's, it's, it's a very big danger, this perversion, perversion and appropriations of meanings. Rousseau was not liberalist. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much.